Uh, famous observation, when you're hungry and you have to go into the forest and eat root vegetables and leaves, uh, leafy greens that you find, Heart disease dropped significantly as occurred during World War II in Norway. There were other factors. People go crazy on Twitter when you show this slide because they say people stopped smoking too. They didn't have cigarettes. They were uh, barely alive. But uh, when you uh, go back to more primitive lifestyles where meat is a luxury or unavailable and uh, vegetable whole foods are the only sustenance at least a factor in the drop in death rates from heart disease is diet changes. That led to a flurry of research in addition to the fact that after World War II, there was a rise in heart attacks, particularly in uh, executives came home from the war with cigarettes and wives went to work out of the house and carrying dinners became the rage and fast food. So from 1939 on, people were studying various dietary approaches to why does heart disease develop. Uh, it took a little longer to figure out there were other factors. Uh, by the 1960s, we were on top of cigarette smoking and diabetes and high blood pressure and family history. All those were figured out. But diet was the original focus. So let's give credit to a internal medicine doctor in Los Angeles, now deceased, just around the corner in my office, I have uh, many books by Dr. Lester Morrison. Um, and he had a large practice of patients with heart disease. But in 1948 and 49, there wasn't much to offer. So he developed a handout. And this is the handout. He gave his heart patients a handout. Cut most of the fat out of your diet, which really means cut most of the animal foods out of your diet. Get rid of the liver and the brain and the very fatty meats and the whole dairies and butters and the egg yolks and the baked goods and desserts, the concentrated fats, beyond butter, uh, lard and the rest, rich gravies, olives, nuts, avocados, get rid of them. And he saw some responsiveness. So he did actually, that's why this is so fundamentally important. He did a randomized study, the thing that people look for, the thing that's never been done with the ketogenic diet, the carnivore diet, the paleolithic diet, and heart patients. Dr. Morrison took 100 patients who had a heart attack in the last six months, and he gave them that handout, or he told them, see you every so often, and uh, followed them. After three years, the men dropped weight, 25 pounds, 166 to 141. These were skinny Americans in 1951. And the women dropped on average 21 pounds, 145 to 124. And without any cholesterol medicine, the cholesterol fell from over 300 to 220. Uh, as an average, that's an incredibly powerful average. And people felt well. They said their heart symptoms got better. Their energy was good. This was a sustainable diet. But most dramatic was the 12 year follow up that Dr. Morrison published a little later that none of the control group, the people that were eating fast foods and donuts and baked goods and butter and lard, uh, were alive. And about half of the heart patients at a very early time, I call it primitive time, Neanderthal time in terms of heart care, half of them were still alive or just about half of them. So, very exciting data that was published so people could read it. So maybe Mr. Nathan Pritikin, a aerospace engineer, could read the data. And Mr. Nathan Pritikin was a very curious engineer, not an MD. He was in Santa Barbara uh, creating products for the US government and others in the aerospace field. And he was curious what Dr. Morrison was doing because it was in the newspapers. And he went down and got his cholesterol checked and it was awful, it was over 300. And he was eating like a typical American celebrating post-World War II uh, booming economy pretty much. And he said, I'm gonna take that hand out and follow it. And his cholesterol fell ridiculously, I think down to about 120 from over 300. Not everybody gets that response, but some do. And a lot of that is your microbiome and your genetics, whether you're APOE4 or APOE3 and whether you have something called APOC3 or not. So you can check genetically whether you're probably going to be a big time responder in terms of your cholesterol, the diet. 
And he said, I'm an engineer, but I'm going to start telling everybody I know about what happened to me and what Dr. Morrison's doing. And he ultimately uh, took over a hotel and started doing seminars and overnight stays and ultimately developed a three-week program. You can come to me with obesity or diabetes or high blood pressure or anginal chest pain, and my team will work with you. Ultimately, his team included doctors. He wrote this up. His books were world famous and multi-million uh, copy sellers. He also incorporated fitness. He loved to run even in his clothes between meetings. He was a very high energy man. Um, and he published research with medical doctors so that the research could get into journals, even though there was resistance. Some didn't want an engineer to publish research. A three-week inpatient stay in a hotel setting with all the food provided and exercise. Exercise could be walking 100 feet. Exercise could be a light jog, depending on your status. The fat content was low based on Dr. Morrison's work. It was plant-based. There were occasional meals of fish and bison. There were thousands of people recorded in a database before there was the internet and Excel spreadsheets. And cholesterol fell and weight fell and blood pressure fell and symptoms improved. And quite remarkable data that clinically people could reverse their cardiovascular disease. Uh, if he's ever had an example of a heart catheterization reversed, I've not seen it, but people felt better. Of course, one of the patients was the famous grandmother of Michael Greger, MD, of the book, How Not to Die and How to Diet. Um, and his grandmother walked in as a cripple, uh, basically being given a very short uh, prognosis and walked out soon thereafter in excellent shape uh, and lived decades. So there was this data from Dr. Morrison, data from Mr. Pritikin, and there comes a young medical student who in 1978, 1979, he was like 22 or 23 years old, put some people in a hotel room, fed them whole food plant-based diets, but because of an influence he had early in his own life on Eastern meditative and yoga practices, here is his guru, literally, uh, Sachi Dananda, a very famous author and yogi and uh, writer and uh, speaker. Uh, gave the opening address at uh, the famous Woodstock uh, Festival. Uh, Dr. Ornish incorporated more than just food. He did lifestyle. He did stress management. He did yoga. He did love and connection and groups and walking. And he, in 1979, then published in 1983, uh, if my math is right, 40 years ago, published a small pilot study that people felt better and their stress tests got better quickly with what is now called the Ornish Lifestyle Program. He went back to school, he graduated medical school, then he took another year off because now he was able to get some funding uh, from some big shots. And he did uh, what's called the Lifestyle Heart Trial, now a randomized study using a food pyramid largely of whole foods, vegetables, fruits, beans and legumes, whole grains, non-fat products like cereals, whole grains, uh, this was, uh, you know, 1986, 87, 88, 89. So he did let people have some non-fat dairy and some egg whites under the advice of some nutritional experts that uh, uh, this was all pre-Trader Joe, Whole Foods and other markets like that, fresh time. Uh, people uh, were scrambling to create recipes. Moderate exercise, stress reduction, smoking, cessation, Published in 1990, in fact, July 21, 1990, the one-year results. Then he published the five-year results. And the five-year results should be hanging in every cardiology office in the world like they hang in mine. Um, what happens to 48 patients where half of them get usual care, <clears throat> all of them having moderate to severe heart blockage, and half of them get intensive lifestyle group support, the Ornish program five-year follow-up, and they had a heart catheterization before, in the middle, and at the end of the study. They volunteered to do this because there was no coronary CT angiography at the time. You had to do it invasive, but it's basically the same approach. And to Dr. Ornish's amazing credit, he had computers read these catheterizations, not eyeballs, because eyeballs doesn't cut it for precision, no matter how good you are. 
And if you look over at the baseline, <laughs> excuse me, the average amount of narrowing in the heart arteries altogether was 41% in the two groups. The control group got worse and worse over five years. Look at the red. If you see red, you have a problem. Look at the black dots. And they got worse and worse. What happened to the white squares? The amount of narrowing got better and better. And I'm suggesting to you that was soft plaque that was regressing. It didn't just stay the same. It got better. First time ever demonstrated. There also were in these patients blood flow measurements by something called PET scans, PET, positon emission tomography. And the amount of blood flow increased three to 400% on average. Amazing, because when arteries get even a little bit cleaner, there's a lot more blood flow because of the function of four to the radius of the artery. And this is important work. <laughs>